This is a unique occasion. I cannot remember before having so many church representatives all attending one meeting. This meeting between so many churches has been called because we are living in a changing area. The skyline of this area used to be dominated by church spires. Now we see the towers of temples and mosques. Now as churches, we are working in a multicultural, multi-faith, multi-ethnic area. The question we are looking at today is, how can we most effectively reach out to our new neighbours? How can we as a church in this area be most effective in this new changing environment? How can we as a church be good neighbours? It is unfortunate that we seem to have remained in our church groups. I can see Pastor Particular of the Exclusive Brethren on one side of the room with most of his congregation behind him and on the other side of the room Reverend Pluralism with her congregation from St Diversity and in the middle we have Father Inclusivist and his flock. But I'm sure you will have much wisdom to share on the relationship between the Christian Church and other faiths. That was a very nice introduction from the Chair, but I think we need to be clear in our objectives. You talk about how we can most effectively reach out to our new neighbours. As far as I can see, this meeting should be about that outreach. We should be thinking about how we can be most effective in leading people to Christ in evangelism. That is the most effective means of reaching out to our neighbours from other faiths. Are you suggesting that these sincere people from other religions need saving or something? You're talking as if you're some 19th century missionary going to East Africa to convert the native. Our new neighbours are educated, devout people. They need respect. We could learn a lot from them. They don't need saving or whatever your pious phrase was. But the scriptures make it quite clear that people can only be saved if they have faith in Jesus. I have the passage here from Acts chapter 4 verse 12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. It cannot be clearer than that, that to be saved people need to hear about Jesus. And even a Sunday school child knows what Jesus said to his disciples about him being the only way to salvation. He made it quite clear that he was the way, the truth and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but by him. Why would we not want to share that glorious good news of salvation with our new neighbours? They might be sincere, but in following other gods, they, according to scripture, are sincerely wrong. God, you can see this leading to world peace, can't you? There's people with your attitude that leads to religious disagreement and strife. Surely as a church, we're wanting to be a peaceful influence on this area, not causing more conflict. In fact, I can't believe what I'm hearing. It sounds as if you're saying that you have the truth and everybody else is in error. You have the light and everybody else is in darkness. That is not what we are saying. It's not our truth I am talking about. It is God's truth. I am just one beggar showing another beggar where to get bread. I am just as much a sinner as they are. It is all very well you being shocked at what we are saying, but to say that it is only through explicitly responding to the gospel of Christ that people are saved is the view that the church has taken down the ages, and there is plenty of evidence to support, to support this. St Augustine, the most influential theologian in the West, was fundamentally an exclusivist, largely insisting that salvation is only achievable within the church. This was underlined by the medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas, who wrote, Outside the church there is no salvation. It is like Noah's Ark at the time of the flood. The reformers were just as adamant on this point. In his large catechism, Luther declared, For where Christ is not preached, there is no Holy Spirit to create, call and gather the Christian church. And outside it, no one can come to the Lord Christ. But outside the Christian church, that is, where the gospel is not, there is no forgiveness and hence no holiness. And he also said that those who remain outside Christianity, 
be they heathens, Turks, Jews or false Christians, Roman Catholics, although they believe on only one true God, yet remain in eternal wrath and perdition. The great reformer John Calvin also made this clear. Surely after the fall of the first man, no knowledge of God apart from the mediator has had power unto salvation, wrote Calvin. And if you think what I am saying is extreme, Calvin believed that all non-Christian religions were false. Talking of Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, Calvin says, Christ answered the Samaritan woman, You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. In these words, Jesus condemns all pagan religions as false. Luther also thought that all worship and religions outside Christ are the worship of idols. So the position we are taking is not extreme. It is a view that has been echoed throughout the church down the centuries. The most famous theologian of the 20th century, Karl Barth, also argued that there is no genuine knowledge of God outside of God's revelation in Jesus Christ. So for me to suggest that people need to come to Jesus for salvation, whatever background they are from, is not extreme. It is the position of the church down the ages. But even without the tradition of the church, as I have pointed out already, the scriptures are clear that salvation only comes through hearing and responding to the gospel of Christ. You as exclusivists say scripture is your guide, but the way you use scripture leaves a lot to be desired. You quote the Bible, Acts 4.12, saying, There is no other name but Jesus, under heaven, given among mortals by which we must be saved. But you say nothing about the context in which this is said. If only you would look at the context of the text, you would see that it does not support your use of the text. In the context, the Jewish Sanhedrin are questioning Peter and John about the healing of a lame man. They are not questioning him about the fate of those who belong to other religions. The Sanhedrin wanted to know by what authority Peter and John were healing, and Peter was answering that question. Peter was not talking about the fate of people in religions other than Christianity. When applying what Peter says to people of other faiths, you're ripping it out of its original context. If you want to be true to scripture, you need to be true to the context in which it was written. You're reading your only agenda into this verse in Acts and not noticing the question the verse was originally addressing. If you can ignore the context in this way, you can make verses in the Bible mean whatever you like. In its context, it's clearly not a verse about your salvation generally, but about by whose authority Peter and John were healing. You also seem to be suggesting that people are never saved without hearing about Jesus. But that's not true to scripture either. Let me ask you a simple question. How much does an Israelite at the time of Moses know about Jesus? Not very much, I would imagine. How much of the gospel message would they have heard? Nothing, I would have thought. But an Israelite at the time of Moses was a member of God's covenant chosen people, was experiencing God's salvation. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 uses the people of Israel at the time of Moses as an example of people who are experiencing the salvation of God. So here we have people who are being saved, who have never heard of Jesus and never heard the gospel. According to you, it's only people who have heard the good news of Jesus who can experience salvation. But the scriptures that you tell us we ought to be listening to are suggesting that people who have never heard about Jesus or the gospel are saved. But I also wonder if you're consistent. Let me ask you a simple question. Do you believe children who die before they're old enough to understand the gospel of Jesus are damned? Of course not. That would be totally unfair. I agree. In fact, the majority of Christian theologians throughout history did not believe that an innocent infant dying before the time they were old enough to believe will be damned. So in the case of infants, you believe that they are not condemned even if they have not obviously heard the gospel of Jesus. So it sounds as if salvation can reach those who have not believed. So your suggestion that you need to hear the gospel in order to be saved is wrong. It sounds as if God's grace can reach those who have not believed. And if God's grace can embrace the infant who has not heard the gospel, why can it not reach the unevangelized who has also not heard the gospel through no fault of their own? 
Why is it that we believe that God has not damned the innocent infant who has passed away before they can understand the gospel? Well, if we believe that he condemned them, it would be dishonouring to God. It would make God into a monster. God would be immoral by damning the innocent. But there are many people from other religions who, through no fault of their own, have no chance to respond to Jesus because they've never heard the gospel. Would it not make God into a monster if those people were condemned? The logic of God not condemning the infant and the unevangelized is the same. But for some reason you exclusivists think the infants are not condemned but the unevangelized are, which seems very arbitrary to me. Scripture and reason would suggest that you need to soften your hard line. Not only have you been taking scripture out of context, you've also been suggesting that people need to hear about Jesus to be saved. But that's not true of people who live before the time of Jesus or infants. In fact, what you are saying is dishonouring to God. He would not condemn people who through no fault of their own, because of the religion they've grown up in, do not get to hear about Jesus. So on what basis are people responding to God? What knowledge of God do they have beyond God's revelation of himself in Scripture? Look, it is clear from Scripture that those outside of God's covenant people have some knowledge of him and his law. All I'm saying is that people who have not heard the gospel of Christ will be judged on the basis of what they do know of God and his law. Paul at the beginning of Romans suggests that this knowledge of God and his law comes through human conscience. Let me read exactly what it says. I have it here. The Gentiles do not have the law, but whenever they do by instinct what the law commands, they are their own law, even though they do not have the law. Their conduct shows that the law's commands is written on their hearts. Their conscience also shows that this is true since their thoughts sometimes accuse them and sometimes defend them. And so, according to the good news I preach, this is how it will be on the day when God, through Jesus Christ, will judge the secret thoughts of all. So first, Paul recognises that you could have knowledge of God's law even if you have not received any special revelation. You are aware of God's law through your human conscience, and he also sees that final judgement is related to how you respond to that knowledge of God's law. And there are examples of people within scripture who respond to God who have no knowledge of God and Jesus and are outside his covenant people. You have used a verse out of the Acts of the Apostles to make your point, but there's a story in the Acts of the Apostles of someone outside of Israel who has not heard about Jesus who is used by God to teach Peter a lesson. He is described in the Acts as an upright and God-fearing man. His name, as I'm sure you know, is Cornelius. And what lesson does Peter draw from meeting Cornelius? The lesson is that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So the lesson is clear. You can be acceptable to God even if you've never heard of Jesus and have no knowledge of God's special revelation to his chosen people. This is a passage that John Wesley used to support his belief that people other than Christians could respond to something of the light of God. But this we know that he is not a God of the Christians only, but the God of the heathen also, and that he is rich in mercy to all who call upon him, according to the light that they have, and that in every nation he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. Interestingly, in Hebrews 7, 17, Jesus is described as a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. But who is Melchizedek? Was he part of God's chosen people Israel? No, he was not part of the Old Testament covenant people. He was the king of Salem. But if Jesus is a high priest in his order, he sounds pretty acceptable to God, even if he was not part of God's chosen people, Israel. So, not only are the covenant people of the Old Testament saved, even though they've not heard about Jesus, there are examples of people outside of Israel who find God's favour. We are not the first Christians to face such relig religious diversity and to ask fundamental questions about how Christianity should relate to people of other faiths. We see Paul in Athens acknowledging a connection between the unknown God the Greeks worshipped and the one he had come to tell them about. Within the first few centuries of the early church, they developed a Logos theology within the group of theologians known as apologists. Their theology was very much about how to relate to those who were from other faiths and cultures. Justin Martyr, one of the apologists even thought that a philosopher like Socrates had some share in the Logos of God. As he writes, We have been taught that Christ is the firstborn of God, and we have declared above that he is the word 
of whom every race of men were partakers. And those who live reasonably are Christians, even though they have been thought atheists, as among Greeks, Socrates and Heraclitus. The key scriptural text for them would have been John 1, 9. The word was the real light that gives, every, that gives light to everyone, the true light which enlightens everyone. To paraphrase the words of Augustine, they believe that all truth is God's truth. Justin believed that even though something of the divine Logos has been seen throughout history, particularly in the great philosophers, this Logos was incarnate in Jesus. He makes this clear in a passage in his second apology. Let me read it to you. Our doctrine surpasses all human teaching because we have the word in his entirety in Christ who has been manifested for us body, reason and soul. All the right principles that philosophers and lawgivers have discovered and expressed, they own to whatever of the word they have found and contemplated in part. The reason why they have contradicted each other is that they have not known the entire word which is Christ. Like Justin Martyr, the second century theologian Irenaeus believed people before the coming of Christ could know something of the Logos of God. He believed they did this by reflecting on creation. Here we see the beginnings of natural theology. The knowledge of God which humans can reach through the cosmos is already on their part a response to a revelation of the Logos. For creation is itself a divine manifestation. By means of the creation itself, the word reveals God the creator and by means of the word of the Lord, the maker of the world. Irenaeus, in fact, could talk about people from the very beginning having a place in God's kingdom. For it was not merely those who believed on him in the time of Tiberius Caesar that Christ came, nor did the Father exercise his providence for the men only who are now alive, but for all men altogether, who from the beginning, according to their capacity, in their generation have both feared and loved God and practiced justice and piety towards their neighbours. Wherefore he shall, at his second coming, give them a place in his kingdom. It was the third century Eastern Father Oregon that brought this Logos theory to its fullest expression. He wrote, For in every generation the wisdom of God passing into those souls which it ascertains to be holy converts them into friends and prophets of God. So, these fathers of the church could see salvation reaching beyond the confines of the church. People could respond and receive a saving knowledge of God without explicitly hearing the gospel or hearing about Jesus. It did not mean that they were not critical of other faiths, though. They believed that the clearest revelation of God was found in Jesus and other beliefs could be judged in the light of this knowledge. A full revelation of God can be seen in the face of Jesus Christ. In comparison, others could only see a dim reflection of that. None of these theologians were suggesting that something else was the source of salvation. Christ was always the source of salvation. But people could respond to God while not knowing it was through Jesus that this was made possible. The Roman Catholic theologian Karl Rahner called these people who were responding to God without a knowledge of Jesus anonymous Christians. Now it might sound strange that people are participating in the benefits of Jesus' saving work without knowing about Jesus, but Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 can argue in this that way. When talking about the Israelites in the wilderness at the time of Moses, he talks about a miraculous water that the God provided through Moses striking a rock and says, All ate the same spiritual bread and drunk the same spiritual drink. They drunk from the spiritual rock that went before them, and that rock was Christ himself. They did not know the rock they were drinking from was Christ. But according to Paul, they could drink from the water of life that Christ provided without knowing that it was from him. So, even though it may be strange to think about people participating in what Christ has done without knowing about Jesus, Paul in this passage sees this as a possibility. 
Now, some people think that inclusivism does not fit well with the mission of the church, but the outreach of the church has been pretty inclusivist. For example, a lot of Christian mission across the centuries has tried to enculturate the gospel in its mission, taking what was good in these cultures and communicating the gospel in those terms, building on what they saw was good in these new contexts. The Second Vatican Council, the Roman Catholic Church, has taken up this idea when it states, the Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in these religions. She has high regard for the manner of life and conduct, the precepts, the doctrines, which although different in many ways from her own teaching, nevertheless often reflect a ray of truth which enlightens all men. Does this not undermine the need for evangelism? If we know that people already have a knowledge of God and his law, say through their conscience and can respond to that, why do we need to share the gospel? What was the point in sending missionaries and risking so much if we knew these people could respond to God without them? Ironically, in your desire not to offend people of other faiths, I think you end up sounding rather patronising. Inclusivism seems to be saying to people from another faith that they are not real Hindus or Muslims, but actually they are anonymous Christians, that they think they are believing in the things of their own faith, but in reality they are believing in Jesus. In fact, you are still saying that salvation only comes through Jesus. It's just that the people of other faiths don't know this. They think their salvation is coming through Muhammad and the Quran but in reality you are saying to them that salvation only comes through Jesus, it's just that they don't recognise that. It does not sound as if you are taking these other religions seriously at all. I think if I were from another faith and heard what you were saying, I would be offended. I would insist that I am not gaining salvation through your Jesus or your religion. I am not an anonymous Christian. I am a Muslim or Sikh or Hindu. I don't know why you inclusivists don't go the whole hog and become pluralists. Come on, admit that all the major religions are equally valid expressions of the same religious impulse and all are equally valid ways of talking about the same divine reality. In fact, I would argue that the most sophisticated Christian theology down the ages has been moving in the direction of pluralism. For example, when the great theologians of the past analysed how we talk about God they realised that God transcended our human language, that our language about God can never fully grasp God's nature or being, and that our human language inevitably falls short of what it is pointing to. As Thomas Aquinas put it, the utmost of human knowledge of God is to know that we cannot know God. For the divine substance, by its immensity, transcends every form that our intellect can reach and thus we cannot apprehend it by knowing what it is. So here Thomas is suggesting that God, God transcends our human language to such an extent that, strictly speaking, we do not know God's divine nature. Now this may sound strange, but there is a long Christian tradition, particularly in the East, that is very cautious concerning to what extent our language can capture or represent the divine nature. This tradition seems to influence Western theologians like Thomas through the 6th century writer Pseudo-Dionysius. But whether they realised it or not, this has implications for any theology of religions. If this insight is correct, we cannot claim that our knowledge of God is true and other people's claims to know God are false, as all our language falls short of its target. On this reckoning, to say that we know God and other religions do not is not something a Christian theologian could ever claim, because we have to admit that our human language and understanding could never fully know God. So, at the heart of Christian theology, at its most sophisticated, is a pluralism that says we cannot exclude other people's perceptions of God, because the being of God is a mystery and cannot be fully fathomed by any of our language. So we have to admit that all the great religions seem to be expressing the mystery of God in their own way. And because we do not fully know God, we cannot say that one way is better than any other. It is clear that the most sophisticated theologians from the early church, right through the medieval period, when they considered our human language about God, were heading in the direction of pluralism. I don't think you really believe what you're saying. 
I think if you enter into religious dialogue, you would quickly have reservations about how some people talk about God. I would not be surprised if you have reservations about your own tradition. See, I don't believe you think all our language about God is on an equal footing. For example, last Sunday I preached about a biblical theme that is rarely preached about, but needs to be preached about more. I preached a sermon about God's judgment. We focused on God's righteous anger, what the Bible speaks about when it talks about God's wrath. We looked at what the scriptures say about what happens to those who reject God and the everlasting fires of hell. Now, I don't think your congregation would hear a sermon like that coming from your pulpit. In fact, I think some of your congregation would walk out if I preached that sermon in your church, St Diversity, whatever it's called. Well, you don't seem to be talking about a God of love anymore. A God of wrath is not the God we see in Jesus. But do you not see that in objecting to how I speak about God, you are contradicting yourself? You said we cannot exclude other people's talk about God, even in other religions, because our language falls short of who God is. In saying God is a God of love and not a God of wrath, you are saying you know enough about God to exclude my views. If you know sufficiently about God to exclude my views, it is surely possible to know enough about God to exclude the views of another religion. And if that is right, then your argument from language about God fails. See, if you're not consistent, things get very confusing. Either our language about God falls so far short of God that one expression is as good as another, and therefore a God of wrath is on the same level as a God of love. Or you are saying that our language does say something true about God, and a God of love is a better description of God than a God of wrath. If that is the case, what you are expressing is inclusive or exclusivism, and not pluralism. In fact, as we have seen, your argument from the nature of religious language does not work within your own religion, let alone other faiths, where I am sure you will find some language about God just as unacceptable as mine. Another problem we have is that the Bible is full of complaints about idolatry, about worshipping what is not the true God. All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Who fashions a god or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame, and the craftsmen are only human. Let them all assemble, let them stand forth, they shall be terrified, they shall be put to shame together. How can you condemn someone for not worshipping the true God if none of our language about God is true, if it all falls so far short of the divine reality and it is all shrouded in mystery? Can you hold on a moment? You have got so carried away in your criticism of pluralism you have not heard all I have to say. Imagine a farmer who insisted that his system of farming was far superior to his neighbours. He claims that he grows his crops in a far better way and with far better techniques than his neighbours. But when it came to the harvest, it turns out that the harvest they have was pretty much the same. The fruit that was produced was the same. You might justifiably doubt that one system of agriculture was that different to another. Now, according to our exclusivist and the inclusivists here, you have the genuine faith and everyone else has not. You are in touch with the transcendent in a way the others are not. So as your faith is superior, should it not be producing better fruit in the way of holy lives, greater charity, better community than other faiths? But as far as I can see, I don't think the fruits of your faith are that different to what we see in other faiths. So why should we believe that you have the way and others do not? I think you misunderstand the nature of Christianity. The New Testament never suggests that the faithful have arrived as far as salvation and sanctification is concerned. Christians down the ages have recognised that until glory they remain sinners. St Augustine said that the church was not a community of saints, it was a school of, for sinners. I might claim that Jesus is the only way, but I am still very much on the way, very much still being saved. You keep interrupting when I've not finished. What I believe as a pluralist also reflects the character of God. A benevolent and just God would surely give people an equal chance to respond to his love. 
The God of your inclusivism is not such a God. You seem to be saying that God has only revealed himself to one people in one geographical area, Israel, and ultimately in one person, Jesus. If God is benevolent, he would have found a way to reveal himself to all nations for all to know him. As far as a benevolent God is concerned, your particularism is scandalous. Surely it is partly humanity's fault that God's revelation of himself is not more widely known. One could argue that the Old Testament people of Israel failed in their role to be a light to the nations, and the church has failed in its role to be the body of Christ in the world and failed in its mission to the ends of the earth. If you're going to respect human freedom, then God will have to work in history within the limits of that freedom. And in those circumstances, people may fail to be that light to the nations he wants them to be. As an inclusivist, I don't have this problem. I believe that all people experience something of the light of God to which they can respond. And as I've argued, you can see something of this idea within the scriptures themselves. John 1, 9, for instance, the word was a real light that give light to everyone. Again, I have not finished. What I also wanted to say is that one of the biggest problems you have is that you don't really value religious diversity. Both you exclusivists and the inclusivists are not really interested in religious dialogue. You're just interested in religious conversion. You want people to recognise the superiority of the revelation seen in Jesus. As far as your final goal is concerned, you inclusivists and exclusivists are just the same. Come on, as a pluralist, you either end up being agnostic or just as judgmental and as imperialist as the rest of us. How do you get there? Well, if I ask you what religion you believe in, it has to be a mixture of all the other religions, because you believe there is truth in all religions. So you end up inventing your own eclectic faith, which has taken everything that is true and good from all the others. And whatever you use as your criteria for what is true and good will be used to pass judgment on whether you find it in other faiths. So you end up in a position where you are right in what you think is true and good, and anybody who disagrees with you is bound to be seen as wrong. But this is sounding just as judgmental as the exclusivist or inclusivist. The only way of getting out of this dilemma is to be agnostic. So if I ask you what religion you believe in, rather than saying I believe X, Y or Z is true in all religions, you will have to say I don't know what the truth is about God and you end up being agnostic. So as I said, you either end up being just as judgmental as the rest of us by coming up with your own faith, which is a mixture of all the faiths you've encountered, or you end up being agnostic. And if you don't watch it, you could end up being a judgmental agnostic. For every time you meet a faith that believes something, you have to challenge them and say, none of us really know what God is like. And if you keep doing that, you end up annoying the majority of faiths you encounter. There is a point of view that none of you have suggested so far that might be seen as postmodern option. Much of the modern analysis of religion treats the different cultures, languages and traditions that we belong to and in which we express our religious beliefs as only skin deep. They assume that under the surface of the diverse religious traditions there are common ideas and common experience. This tendency can probably be traced back to how Western thought has interpreted the different religions and cultures it encountered as it expanded. The tendency was to treat whatever it came across as just a variety of what it was familiar with. It was familiar with Christianity, so everything it came across that was vaguely religious in the new th cultures was thought to function in the same way it would within Christianity. All religions are just a variation on some common theme, and common themes were originally taken from Christianity. This suits the pluralists here who want to see all religions as leading to the same thing, all expressions of the same thing. But the postmodern perspective wants to question this. 
Sorry, I'm not getting this. I think in less conceptual terms. Can you give me an illustration? Well, the simplest example I can think of is the difference between a box of chocolate biscuits and a box of chocolates. When you open a variety box of chocolate biscuits, they can all look very different, different shapes, sizes and colours. But you know that when you bite into them, you're going to encounter the same thing. That's the modernist approach to religion that we can easily fall into. But what happens if religions are more like chocolates and less like the biscuits? See, it's the other way around. The chocolates may look similar on the outside. They're all covered in chocolate. But when you bite into them, you realise that there is only a superficial similarity. The postmodern perspective takes the difference between faiths seriously. It takes seriously the prospect that these differences might go all the way down and that the similarities might only be skin deep. Well, if this postmodern analysis is true, we cannot make some overall generalizations about all religions being similar in some way. For example, if you take their differences seriously, we cannot say that essentially all religions lead us to the same thing. We might discover that it's not their differences that are only skin deep, but it is their similarities that are only skin deep. As one writer has expressed it, this tradition-specific postmodern perspective rejects pluralism, which it sees as speaking of universals, regards inclusivism as incoherent, because it tends towards a view that every religion is essentially similar in nature. Each faith is unique. Alterity is stressed over similarity, as seemingly common elements in religious experience or doctrine are regarded as superficial. It's only possible to speak from a specific tradition there can be no pluralistic interpretation. Perhaps another way to understand the tradition-specific nature of this perspective is to use the old story of three people who are led into a dark room and are asked to feel around and say what they find. When they come out of the room, they're also surprised to see how different their experiences have been. One person says, there must be a great tree in there. I came across something like a great trunk coming up from the floor. The next one says there was a great snake in there. The third says a great immovable mass. Then the person conducting the experiment, laughing, opens the door of the room, puts the light on and reveals an elephant. They had all been feeling the same thing and they laugh at how silly they've been. Now clearly this is a pluralistic analogy that says we are all really experiencing the same God but in different forms. But does the analogy work? At one level it clearly does. The people in the dark room are the different faiths feeling their way around with their different religious traditions and experiencing different things. But what about this light? The postmodern critic might suggest that none of us has access to this light. It looks like the light that the Enlightenment thinkers dream of, with which they could step out of all tradition and culture and make a judgment from the outside. The light looks like God's eye point of view, the very thing that postmodern critics are sceptical about. The person turning on the light is really playing God. This is the light of the last judgment. 
Is it not the height of human hubris to claim to play God? The pluralist seems to be claiming a God's eye point of view. But this is a point of view that no human can access to. The postmodern theologian will want to enter religious dialogue with humility, not pretending to know in advance how all religions fit together, and not armed with a meta-narrative of pluralism or inclusivism. They enter a religious dialogue not knowing where it will lead. For them, it's not sewn up in advance. As one writer has put it, inclusivism creates a meta-narrative to explain other faiths and places them in a too simplistic relationship to Christianity. We cannot be sure of God's activity in other faiths. The relationship of Christianity and other faiths remains a mystery. Rather than embrace some meta-narrative such as inclusivism and pluralism, a number of theologians from this tradition-specific postmodern perspective have wanted to take seriously a tradition that de developed in the early church. This tradition, witnessed too in the Apostles' Creed, is that of Christ's descent into hell. From the second century, it was held by some that Christ's descent into hell was to preach the gospel to those who had died before the incarnation, incarnation and to guide them into heaven. The first church father to develop this theme was Clement of Alexandria at the end of the second century. The key text for him was from 1 Peter 3. For Christ went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. This also found support in another early Christian text, the Shepherd of Hermans which says, The apostles and teachers who preached the name of the Son of God after they had fallen asleep in the power and faith of the Son of God preached also. To them that had fallen asleep before them, so by their means they were quickened into life and came to the full knowledge of the name of the Son of God. As one writer's put it, the doctrine of Christ's descent into hell and release of souls, therefore, was well established by the end of the first century. One of the advantages of this tradition is that with the exclusivist, it is only through a knowledge of Christ and the preaching of the gospel that people are saved. It means also that you're not left with how to explain the injustice of the damnation of the unevangelized, as they are evangelized beyond the grave. I think this evening we have heard a whole spectrum of opinions on this topic, and people are sufficiently informed now to make up their own minds.